Mic check one two, mic check one two. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino. What's up? What's going on? Episode number 101. 101. 101. 101. 101. 101. Back again in the hot seat. How are you guys and girls doing out there? Good? Fair? Okay? Not too bad? All right. Yeah, welcome back to the Xeno Zinger Show. Um, I am I am not on the mo- I'm not in my most um high functioning level that I could be on because you know I have a little ailment inside my esophagus. But apart from that, I thought I would make sure I made my best effort to put out a podcast today because you know last week was a bit of a crazy one, had a bit of a busy week, so I ended up only, only putting out two, one or two, no one I think, only one, which was one episode 100, which I'm really proud of, episode 100, check that out, check that out, check that out, but now we're in a one-on-one, so you know, it's a new week, you can't start the new week shit, and it's the start of September as well, so I, I would like to have done one the first September, but you know, sometimes life gets the best of you, but anyway, we're here now, hope you guys are good, hope you guys are well, well fed, well hydrated, and well rested and stuff like that, and we've had a hug from someone, you maybe fondled somebody's asshole, like all those things I'm hoping you guys have in buckets and spades. I'm back in the hot seat and I'm happy to be right in front of you guys, um, whether you're watching through YouTube, whether you're listening via your podcast applications. I'm happy to be speaking to you once again. Yeah, so we're back again at 101. Um, it's been a pretty um, busy couple of days in the old, um, in my life. Over the weekend, I spent most of my time DJing and hanging out with people. And then I spent most of the time recovering from the DJing and hanging out with people. And then I come to a realization, um, a dreaded realization, because anyone who knows me will know that I try not to think about this issue. And I try to put it in my back of my head. And I try to bury my head in the sand. I try to avoid it at all costs, right? Because I'm somebody who kind of ascribes to the idea that you're only as old as you feel. But I have to admit that these last few weeks and maybe these last few months, I feel as if ages may be catching up with me. Um, I know this might come as a bit of a shock to some of you guys and some of you guys might be a bit sad and a bit, oh my God, I guess, you know, no, you're getting older. Oh my God, come back, stay here, stay. Uh. Right. I know some of you might be worried about that stuff, but rest assured, young, um, young uh, princes and queens uh, or whatever, princes and princesses. Why? Would it be? Anyway, whatever. Rest easy, my, <laughs> my followers. I shall be back again. But yeah, I feel as if my body is telling me that the end is coming soon um not the end of terms of like you know me dying and shit because i'm never gonna die i'm gonna live forever man legendary shit um no no not that but you know i feel as if my body's telling me that the i have to maybe hang up my um socializing clubbing gloves or you know my so-called socializing and clubbing um jaden double stack dr martin boots because it feels like i can't do it as consistent as i thought i could you know, there was a period in my in my life, right? Maybe mid twenties, early twenties, when I was, was when I was really hot in these fucking Dawson streets, right? Hot in these Shoreditch streets, hot in these Hackney streets, right? Hot, hot in these Whitechapel, Bethnal Green streets, hot in East London streets, right? Where I'd go out Wednesday to Sunday, like consistently, right? And keep and and hold down a solid job, right? Full time job. But if I look back at it, right, if I look back at the times where I've kind of got let go from jobs because I've turned up late seven times in a row, or if I look at the times where I've had to leave a, I had to leave a job because I just wasn't performing well enough, or if I looked at any time where I had to leave a job because I got bored or because I felt I knew what I was doing in my career, it usually coincided with me going absolutely off the rails outside of work. It usually has, it was a, it was a, it wasn't, there was, there was, it wasn't, um, it was always a, it was running parallel, these issues, right? Me going off my head outside and me kind of like going off the rails at work. It kind of, they ran congruently, right? Side by side. And, um, but I, but there were periods in my time working at that, when I was, you know, hanging around working and doing my thing where I was able to, to sustain that level of going out in this, right? That level of fuck it up with the I was able to do it. I could just go rage hard, work harder, rage harder, work harder, I mean, all the time. But now I feel as if I just can't do it anymore. And the realization came probably um, to me after the whole bank holiday weekend thing, right? Because 
as anyone would know, for most people that work full time, or for most people that work a job they don't really enjoy, or for most people that live in London or live in the UK, bank holiday weekends are a big deal, right? Because it's even an opportunity for you to like sit, lie in your bed and scratch your balls, right? Or it's an opportunity for you to go out and just get fucking wasted um, without no real consequences, right? Because you've got a free day weekend. So effectively, if you, if you want to go get fucked up, if you're smart and you want to get fucked up from the Thursday, right? Especially if you've got bank holiday Friday, bank holiday Monday vibe, you can get fucked up from Friday, Thursday. You can sleep in on Friday, you can go out again on Saturday, sleep in on Sunday, and then have a full, whole free day on Monday just to doss around, right? So it's kind of a weekend, it's kind of a weekend to kind of really go crazy. And even if you don't have a free day and it just you just only have the Monday off, you still have the opportunity to kind of like, you know, go crazy on a Sunday, which you don't usually get sometimes. So a lot of people kind of bill up um bank holiday weekends as a big, big deal in, in the UK, or if you're working if you're working a job that you don't really enjoy, it's an opportunity for you to let your hair down. But I saw a change in me because even though my, the job that I work in is not necessarily a job that I hate, it's not some, something that I dread going to, you know, there's cool people that work there, it's a great atmosphere, the job's fairly straightforward to do, blah, 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 you get a bit of autonomy to kind of do your own thing in some regards. Um, at the end of the day, it's still employment, right? So I still have aspirations to kind of do my own thing. So there is there is a small um, part of me that's like, you know what, take advantage of the time you got off because usually you're stuck in that place and you can't do anything. But, Oddly enough, even though I had two DJ gigs back, kind of like, maybe that kind of helped my decision making, but I had a DJ gig on a Friday and on the Sunday, right? But I still made no effort to go outside, like properly go. Plus it was Notting Hill Carnival. And if, and I've not, again, I'm not the biggest Notting Hill Carnival um, groupie, right? I, I love it. I like it. Okay, I like it, but I don't, I'm not like, oh, I have to go every year. I'm not like that kind of guy, right? I'll just go whenever I feel like going. Um, sometimes it's twice a year, sometimes it's back to back years I'll go, sometimes it might be um, once every other year, right? But I think the last time I might have went was last year. So I bet only missed this year and I might miss again next year, who knows? Especially if we end up moving outside London. But I, I felt no real desire to go and I felt no real FOMO. Um, again, I'm, I might attribute that a lot of it to do with the fact that I'm not using Instagram anymore. So I've kind of locked myself out of my Instagram and kind of just, con just to concentrate my work. It's not like some big so societal stance I'm taking. I'm, I'm not judging anyone that uses it. I'm not saying I'm better than anyone. I just, just for me personally, I thought I needed to take a bit of time off just so I can get things done, right? So I can work out. I can, you know, uh, do my blog. I can record mixes. I can send out emails to get more DJ bookings. I can work out, you know, just stuff that I can do that that takes up time that usually I spend on Instagram. It's the way I just was able to calculate things. But I think that had to con that contribute a lot, a lot to my non feeling left out because i wasn't on there so i didn't see what happened i have no idea i saw a couple of videos on on youtube and boiler room but that was about it i didn't even watch them i just saw a couple of clips and that was about it i don't know what happened i don't know if, if it was the best one ever in the world i don't know whatever happened right and i guess as well because at the older you get the more you start to realize the friends in your social group aren't necessarily as on it as they were back in the day right it's not as a big deal anymore so i kind of left it as that so anyway um that aside um I kind of didn't feel any need to do that, so I kind of kind of chilled out anyway. But even with the DJ gigs themselves, right? Because usually when you DJ, sometimes in bars and clubs, um, especially if you're getting paid like a, no a nominal fee, but it doesn't really matter a nominal fee. Most bars are like most bars are really cool, and they'll they'll kind of sort you out with drink tokens or some drinks, right? Um, so you generally, even even if you are working, you sometimes do get plastered because you know you're sp you're standing up for six hours and six hours or whatever. That I usually I usually play like a minimum of four hours, right? And 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 DJ bars I'm playing in at the moment now, which is great because I love kind of having the ability to kind of like, you know uh, construct the soundscape of the night. But standing up for five hours or to four to six hours a night, um, just drinking liquids or just drinking alcoholic beverages, you're gonna get fucked up one way or the other, right? So you end up getting a little bit drunk anyway, a little bit tipsy. So then by the end of it, when you finish, especially if you've got a bit of Dutch courage, you might end up staying in with the bar staff, having a bit of a lock-in. But you end up being, you end up feeling it anyway, right? So I ended up feeling it. And then I ended up still feeling quite hungover. And I was like, Jesus, imagine how much I would have felt hungover if I would end up, end up going to Carnival on a Monday. I just wouldn't be able to do it. And then this weekend as well, I had I felt the same, um, or this this past weekend just uh, this this weekend just passed. I felt the same kind of you know realization because I ended up DJing at the Alibi for their closing uh, for the last Friday. So um, the Alibi, you know, one of my spiritual second homes, a place where I kind of started my promotional uh, promoter slash kind of DJing journey from um, a place that kind of introduced me to a lot of new people who are outside of my quote-unquote social circle a place that allowed me 
to think that maybe I could, if po- I could, possibility, right? This man's crazy. That I could maybe um, find a career or some sort of pathway in the nightlife industry, right? It was something that I never knew I could possibly do. But once you get given the ability to uh, put on a party, right, to organize something or to gather people in a room, you start to sometimes think, oh, wow, I could do this. I could like double these, right? I could do more. I could do in a warehouse. I could do this. I could do that. So you get these really cool ideas. So I've always kind of got a special part they've always got a special place in my heart even though towards the end it kind of ended a bit you know a bit acrimoniously it didn't end as well as i would have liked it to but you know time moves on um the managers have to make um certain decisions that you know, the club has to because one thing that I, I give them credit right the alibi uh, one one thing uh, uh, in the list of many they they did really well during their heyday or during their long the stretch of time um reinventing that blah reinventing that blah reinventing that bar so no the promoters were uh, for the promoters that started there originally, it was annoying that you weren't able to sustain a night there until the club, the place ended, right? But in some respects, they had to kind of cut off the oldies and bring in kind of fresh blood or new blood into the into the bar. The same way how they rotated a lot of the bar staff and brought in kind of cooler, younger, or just newer faces into the bar staff because that kind of was what made the alibi what it was, right? They had they had these really cool people in the uh, working behind the bar who are um, pursuing music careers or pursuing um, artistic careers, tattooing careers, whatever they were doing, right? And then they also had these like um, quote unquote. Um, uh local heroes right who are promoting nights within the club so it kind of all added to the kind of mystique of the bar um because you always because one thing you always see whenever you walk into the alibi are random people hugging people behind the bar right or spudding them or saying safe like there's actual friends that work there like we actually know each other which you don't really see a lot in mo- you don't really see in most bars by and large anyway really um, maybe maybe it's a thing you see a lot in dive bars because you know most dive bars are frequented by locals who live around the area but for the most part, you don't really see in nightclubs like people spudding bartenders or people that work in the club and say, hey, what's up? Like, you know, because then that makes you feel, oh, you feel comfortable. If you're like a tourist or a regular punter just coming in for the first time, you feel like, oh, this is this is the place to be, right? Like you feel comfortable because there's like a family unit that's kind of hanging around here. But that's one thing I give them credit for. They were able to kind of recycle people and just keep it fresh, right? So for the original people, it might have felt a bit annoying. You might you might have felt like your nose got put out of place because, you know, you were part of the original crew. But I think if you look at it as a business, right, what they did with that with that bar, what Dino and, and those guys did is, is fucking, it's something like to be really heralded and marveled at. Like the fact that the bar was running for like, I think eight years, maybe close to nine years, right? Um, They were able to um sustain loads of different periods of ups and downs within the stri- within that area, within the strip in general. It's a real, real credit to them. Um, But one thing I did notice when I went to DJ on Friday was that I am completely out of depth in that crowd, right? Um, Of course, I know what I'm talking about. Of course, I've earned my stripes. Of course, no one can tell me anything different. But vibe-wise, right, me being in that room, me being in that space, in that basement bar, I did feel a bit out of place. Like, you know, because I haven't been in that area in in years, maybe in a long, long time, like properly, like socializing people and finding out who's who and what and whatnot. And there was a lot of really attractive, cool looking guys and girls hanging out. And I felt old. Like, I'm not, I don't know, I really felt just standing there. I felt old. It's strange. I don't know if I felt like culturally old um, or if I felt old in age or whatever, but I just felt like the old guy in the, in the disco, like for, for the first time than I ever felt in my whole life. Now, I think that has to do with the fact that it's alibi, right? Because when I go to nightclubs and I go to see DJs play and I go to see, imagine if I go to The Fold or if I go to, if I go to like Fabric or if I go to uh, Corsica Studios, it's a bit more of a varied crowd. Corsica Studios depends really on the night because it's next to a university, but it's a bit more of a varied crowd, right? Because, and plus the DJs who you're following are usually within, are usually middle-aged people or people within their late 30s, early 40s. So it attracts, you know, music, people which want to hear them play a set and also people that want to get fucked up. So it's a quite a varied crowd. But when you, but I forgot what it must feel like to go to like a trendy bar, right? Because I'm sure they have them in North. I'm sure they had them in South. Trendy bar that's frequented by art school students, fashion school students, design students, um, people just interning in magazines and shit. You know that kind of cool where everyone's kind of got a cool job. No one's just working a job to get money. Everyone's working at something that pays fucking peanuts, but they want to do it for the clout, right? Or they want to do it for the exposure and shit. So everyone's kind of doing that thing. And I forgot what it felt like to be in that room. I was like, wow. Like, I'm old as fuck in this room, innit? Um, so that was one realisation. Number two realisation, uh, after when I started playing my set, I realised that the other part hasn't changed. 
one bit they might have changed a lot of things some bits of the of the of the place but what they haven't changed is the fucking cdjs right so <laughs> i was i was playing there um uh on friday so i played the last the closing set which was fucking fun i ended up packing up packing in loads of disco and loads of funk and loads of soul just kind of mix up because i knew everyone in there was gonna come hard and be playing techno and house and shit so i just wanted to be different so i packed in loads of disco and loads of funk it was really fun i think everyone enjoyed it and i ended the night out playing um village people ymca well i know people might have been upset about it but i love that kind of stuff so i did it anyway fuck it um but what i realized one thing hasn't changed the other by decks never work they never fucking work i think the left deck q button wasn't work it was kind of stuck and in the right deck, um, the play button was a bit jumpy, right? So it was just a fucking clusterfuck. Imagine, and I was already a bit tipsy trying to figure out if it working. Then number two, they've got CDJ 2000s, but they don't have any link cable. So I had to, luckily I brought two USB sticks with me. If not, I would have got, I would have been fucked. So that was a bit annoying. Um, but yeah, that was quite heartwarming to see that, you know, even though the years have progressed and stuff has happened, the CDJs are still fucked. They're never going to be fixed because, I don't know, m mostly because, you know, there's a thousand different promoters coming in there and p some people are just heavy-handed with that fucking cue. They hold the top of the CDJ and just boom, 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 banging that shit for all their life. Do you know what I mean? So they're always having to repair stuff. Like, it's just a constant, you know, a constant merry-go-round of absolute bullshit. So you, you never kind of get what you want in there, but... The vibe was good, man. The vibe was strong. Everyone had a good time. It was gr it was a great way to kind of close that chapter out. Like I, like I said, I've, I started off my kind of like um, promoting DJing, kind of being a nightlife uh, connoisseur um, journey in that place. You know what I mean? And plus they introduced me to so many new people, friends I'm sure that I'm going to know forever. Um, and just a general good education or good kind of perspective to see somebody who was fairly young uh set up a bar that was very influential and then go on to make loads of other different ventures such as restaurants and other sort of stuff Do you know what i mean like it was good to see it firsthand like you know because sometimes when you're in the when you're in the when you hang out in those kind of areas everyone's sort of like on the same level all the time right there's everyone's intern everyone's kind of scraping and scraping like money here and there no one's kind of no one's got aspirations that big right but when you see someone within your quote unquote peer group who's fucking smashing it right in terms of dino when he's doing in terms of business right you're like it kind of gives you like a bit of motivation a bit of perspective to see like no you can also smash it too you can also come in set up a bar open a restaurant um create a fucking design agency whatever it may be you can do these things yourself um you just have to kind of like put in the work save some money you know whatever connect with people but it's good to see that happening in real life but again that was great and then of course on this fucking saturday i was wounded I felt fucked up for the whole weekend, basically, for the most of it. So, like, again, I said, I think I'm, my body's telling me that I'm getting old. And it's okay. I'm, I'm happy. I'm not, I'm not that bummed out about it because already I've made a transition from um, going out to hipster areas to only going out to club nights. Like, I go to nightclubs and I don't even go to club nights. I go to actual, yeah, actually, I do go to club nights, don't I? Right, I do, yeah. Most of my club, most of my club nights. So, I've made that transition already. I'm not necessarily going to cool here's a place to hang out if i do go to a bar it's probably with a friend to kind of hang out and chill or whatever and get fucked up but that's usually from like 7 to 12 i'm not usually going out until 1 2 3 a.m in that kind of area anymore i'm just kind of like putting a lid on it and then saving my money or saving my time and trying to go out on the weekends to like big nightclubs so that's a realization that i realized over the weekend that maybe this guy's getting old but yeah that was my weekend for the most part and yeah apart from that's been fairly quiet um DJing is taking a bit of a break for the next two weeks, which is nice. So I've been able to kind of recuperate, get some new tunes, uh, think of new directions I want to go in in terms of stuff I want to play. And just generally kind of like, you know, um, pick up where I left up, but kind of like double up and kind of take it to the next level. Because you can kind of get a bit comfortable. You know, I've kind of got my set routine that I play. I kind of got an idea of what I want to do. But I want to mix stuff. I want to mix it up. I want to be a bit different. I want to go in different directions. So hopefully um, these next couple of weeks off, I'm going to be a good chance to kind of like, you know, recal recalibrate the music library um my collection see what i want to play and kind of maybe taking new some new interesting directions anyway apart from me rambling let's get on with the topics episode number one on one let's dive on deep what have we got here go in my notes and let's go in so number one story is about my girl jamila jamil or jamila jamil is that how you pronounce her name um 
I've seen a lot of her online. Uh, mostly, I'm 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 sure people are familiar with her because she's a Channel Four presenter, but I'm not because I don't have a TV because I'm a hipster. Um, but I'm familiar with her because I always see kind of like little um, uh, what you, how, what do you call it activism type videos about her concerning different social issues right she's kind of like one of those people that is always kind of on the forefront in terms of speaking out about certain things and kind of you know standing up for people quote unquote but i'm starting to get a bit annoyed by her because she seems to be a bit of a broken record when it comes to the kim kardashians of these worlds right she seems to have a bit of a bee in a bonnet around young girls being um influenced wrongly by people like kim kardashian and the, the idea and the kind of idea that they place on beauty and all this sort of malarkey right even though some people could say would some people say it's a bit patron ironic or there's double standards there because she's a fairly attractive young lady herself jamila jamil right and she's been given i'm sure the channel for job or other magazine covers or editorial work because she is a fairly attractive um asian lady right um or a very attractive asian lady she's got a real natural beauty she's got match she's got really thick uh flowing hair um so she looks really amazing on camera so there's a lot to, to kind of her career is kind of but then maybe that's part of a part of the issue maybe the fact that she's seen how um um how superficial that world is and the fact that no one cares about her intellect in that world that they only want to promote her beauty that she wants to take a stance in terms of speak up for the people that don't have the chance to know to be put in a magazine because they're beautiful that could be part of it so there could be some sort of there could be a noble act in there but i don't know there's something that kind of seems a bit off about it there's something a bit a little bit uh self-aggrandizing a little bit virtue signally about it a little bit um self-involved I'm not sure what the motivation is because, again, I'll play the video, but there's a video of her kind of talking about the fact that she thinks, um, if you're usually listening on a, a audio, on a podcast, you'll hear the audio, but she kind of basically thinks that um, the Kim Kardashians of this world and all that kind of group, they're, they're kind of secret agents of the patriarchy, right? The patriarchy is the idea, you know, that men should go out and earn money and women should stay in the home so that these women are kind of inadvertently wait, working um, to kind of reinforce the idea of patriarchy because they're so they're so obsessed with the way they look um and this is also driving girls to be obsessed with the way they look which in turn drives them to kind of like seek their value only in their looks and to have men held up in a pedestal blah de, blah blah but i'll play the video anyway for you guys and you guys can kind of judge it and we can kind of expand on the topics a little bit here we go let me get it up on here it's on twitter i think it's on the full interviews on channel four but i'll play a little bit of it now hopefully it shows up on the screen Let's see. There we go. Woman who perhaps unknowingly is still. Let's play it from the beginning and then put a speaker here. The double agent for patriarchy is basically just a woman who perhaps unknowingly is still putting the patriarchal narrative out into the world, is still benefiting off, profiting off, and selling a patriarchal narrative to other women. But it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. You know, just because you look like a woman, we trust you and we think you're on our side. But you are selling us something that is that really doesn't make us feel good. You're selling us a, an ideal, a, a body shape, a, 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 you know, a, a problem with our wrinkles, a problem with aging, a problem with gravity, a problem with any kind of body fat. You're selling us self-consciousness. The, the same poison that made you clearly develop some sort of body dysmorphia or facial dysmorphia, you are now pouring back into the world. You're like recycling hatred. And I find that really dangerous and I think it's unacceptable and I don't care if you're a woman. I think constructive criticism is needed for us, for anyone to ever evolve. For our gender to evolve, we need some sort of constructive uh, criticism, as long as we do it in a somewhat careful way. But money is a great um, magnet, isn't it? I mean, you mm -hmm. said yourself, you got you started doing T4 because somebody said, yeah. it pays a lot of money. Absolutely, but so you I can wasn't see hurting anyone happened. by saying, here's Hollyoaks. No, but what I mean is you, yeah. you can presumably see how any person can be seduced into going along with something that if they stopped and thought about it, they'd go, well... Of course I do, but so many of the worst things in the world have happened motivated by greed, and I just don't think that's an acceptable excuse anymore. How much, how much money do you need? Really, how much money do you need? How much money do, does, do any of these like, huge influencers who are worth millions or billions sometimes, how much more, why are they still promoting appetite suppressant lollipops to young girls? And it's not a fight against obesity. They have young, already slim girls in their adverts for Flat Tummy Company, Flat Tummy Co, whatever they're called now, this company that are absolutely everywhere and they're even being advertised in 
some of the most mainstream magazines, women's magazines, and they have a billboard in Times Square. The money is built on the blood and tears of young women who believe in them, who follow them, who look up to them like the big sister they never had. It's just, it's so upsetting. It feels like such a betrayal against women. And I will not be a part of it. I, and I will not stop calling it out when I see it. Oh, now, I don't know about you guys, but I think that's a bit out of order, right? Um, first of all, saying that people who care about their appearance or care about their looks are suffering from some sort of body or facial dysmorphia is way out of order, right? Also, this idea that um, there shouldn't be... It's weird because... Who are you to, and also the, the kind of last statement about, you know, how much money do they need? In a free market society, who are you to judge how much money anyone makes, right? People should be allowed to make, a, people should be allowed to be as greedy, right, as fucking anyone they want to be, right? They should, they should be allowed to hoard as much coin as they want. They should be able to be as Philip philopentratic or philopentratic, whatever, whatever, whatever it's called. They should be allowed to give away as much as they want as well. But I don't think it's with it's anyone's. Uh, I don't think it's, it's anyone's business, anyone's right to tell you or to tell me how much money we should or should not be earning. That's a very dangerous and slippery slope to get down. I know sometimes with people of wealth or with people that have a lot of resources, right? It can be annoying to see them hoard everything, right? Because um, it's just annoying to see it, right? But the law of nature says that the what you call it um how does it go it says for for the 10 percent of employees that you have five one percent will be doing most of the work right for a that's the kind of the way it goes right so if you're a high performer and you're able to produce jobs for the majority of people then it's only natural or you're able to produce most of the entertainment most of the services most people then it's only normal for you to also hoard most of the things or to have most of the items because you know you're you're able to supply most people with most things it's kind of this kind of con it's, it's kind of where i'm a bit conflicted with the whole jeff bezos criticism right for as much for as evil as they may be for how the working conditions are in amazon there is a uh, there has to be an understanding that for for you for your items to be delivered next day or to be delivered within a 24 hour period there has to be somebody working on the other end who is absolutely sweating their asses off right who is probably working in some sort of unsafe conditions who maybe isn't getting paid what they should be getting paid it, there, there has to be some sort of give some way or the other and for the fact that J jeff Bezos is able to allow you to buy headphones in a minute's notice maybe he should have all the money in the world i don't know if, if that's right or wrong but the fact that he's able to employ so many people the fact that he's able to service so many people in the world if you're able to touch so many people in the world shouldn't you be getting some shouldn't you be getting um rewarded in some way shape or form that's the same argument people have for nurses or teachers right um that industry is a bit fucked up because they don't pay them well enough but the reason why people get annoyed when they hear about a nurse or a teacher getting paid really low right getting paid like 30 out 30 grand a year and they're working i don't know 100 hours a week it's because they know that that person's work is being is it's they're touching so many people every single day right healing mending being a support system to so different many families that they should be compensated, like, you know, it should be a like-for-like -like comparison. So, with the Jamila Jamel thing, I think there is, for as much as she goes on about Kim Kardashian being a secret agent of the patriarchy, there is a little bit, there is some, it, she is a little bit disingenuous. I think sometimes with people like this, and I, and I don't blame her for it, I think there is a little bit of envy and a little bit of jealousy when it comes to speaking about people like Kim Kardashian or people of those kind of ilk. Because when you work in the entertainment industry, I'm sure she's heard stories about Kim K or that kind of Kardashian clan, or she's been in rooms with those kind of people, and she's heard how they are as people, right? She might have heard they're rude, she might have heard they're dumb, da, 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 whatever it may be. She's heard, um, um, what you call it? She's heard firsthand accounts of people that have been in and around their space, and also when you get around them. The, the, the first thing you notice, especially with people that are really high performers or people that are super well known, is that when you get around them, for the, you know, there might be a small minority of people who kind of uh, um, exude that kind of rock star or star persona. But for the most part, they come across as fairly normal people, right? And sometimes if the person doesn't have an extrinsic talent that you can kind of um, grasp or understand, right, or you can kind of put a label on it, it kind of does make you feel a bit bummed out, right, that they're able to command such influence command such um have so much power within the culture or um generate so much money but they seem so ordinary they seem so quote-unquote basics quote-unquote boring right 
it can sometimes feel you can sometimes without even wanting to you can sometimes feel a bit envious of these people right and because i know and i know this has been i know this is true because i've spoken to a few people about it so i think i spoke to some people at work actually the other day about it and they were and this girl was kind of mentioning the fact that she can't help but feel jealous or feel envious about these kids that are able to command a high um consultancy fee when they just come in and look at fabric swatches for half an hour right because she she's been in the same room as them she knows that their opinions aren't as any more valid than hers right um but they somehow managed to craft a lane for themselves where they are an influencer a micro influencer a brand ambassador that's been able to and they've been able to kind of steer the ship branding wise of certain brands and it can sometimes make you feel a little bit you know oh, man this girl's 16 and she's being paid twenty five thousand consultancy fee right um and you're kind of seeing the same sort of sea change happening in the football journalism. Again, it's a weird connection I'm making, right? But stick with me. In the football journalism world and punditry world, there's a bit of a reaction within the football journalism world, for the most part, against fan channels, right? Because, you know, fan channels, for the most of the, for the most part, especially the ones that I detest, are really like, sh you know, when you see their thumbnails, it's always like, you know, like fucking really shouty, idiots right who kind of like you know that just really shouty you know the kind of like wwe fans oh my god he didn't say that did you see that you know that kind of like really boisterous bombastic unnecessary like shouting unnecessary like um unnecessary uh peacocking of teams that aren't, aren't nothing to do with you like weird just weird just weirdos you know that kind of like freaky kid in class that was super enthusiastic about david beckham like he just a bit weird a bit creepy right but you're seeing a reaction against those fan channels because for the most part, journalists don't want to admit that. Put aside those freaks, right? There are genuine uh, football enthusiasts who speak well and who kind of have a good understanding of football and can kind of articulate their thoughts, even though they might have rose-colored tinted glasses on, uh, blue tinted glasses on, whatever tinted glasses on of their team they support. They're able to have a very balanced and nuanced view of football. So a lot of these foot pun uh, journalists are getting their nose out of place because um, a lot of the football fans are, would much prefer to see someone that looks like them, sounds like them, supports the club that they support, speak about the things that they care about, as opposed to a journalist or a pundit who has a, their own agenda, right? Or an agenda that they're not being, um, they're not being um, outwardly with. They're not, they're not kind of, it's like even in sports, in football punditry for the most part, most of those guys don't even say the team they support right they don't even mention it it's really weird undercurrent of like you know they, they kind of like always have a good thing to say about liverpool but unless you dig in deep and go to wikipedia you will have to you won't realize oh actually that's why because he played in for liverpool for 25 years but they don't in, they don't um say it out loud that i support liverpool or my son plays for everton that's why i'm not having a bad word to say about everton they don't even say it so most fans will prefer going in that direction so there's been a bit of a a weird there's a bit of weird conflict between the journalists and between football fan channels because the journalists feel as if like the fan channels are taking away their eyes and, and ears from their columns or from their speeches on or their kind of clips on podcasts and stuff or whatever. And it feels as if the same kind of thing is happening within the kind of quote unquote beauty, body positivity, body positivity kind of space or in that kind of influence space. Because a lot of those, especially if you're Jamila Jamil, if you're a good looking girl, and you have a brain, and you can speak very well, you know, she's very articulate, she puts her point across very well, even though I, I don't agree with parts of it, you can get, you're, 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 you're well within your rights to feel annoyed that these young girls would much prefer to listen or to look at Kim, Kylie, Kendall, Chloe, Courtney than you. It makes sense, right? It's only natural, but I think there has to be an admittance, you have to admit that that's a reason why you're upset. You can't say it's because you think they're secret agents to the patriarchy, because it doesn't make any sense because it's, it's as if you're saying girls are not allowed there's not an, a, a portion of girls out there who are not allowed to be vain because it's it's, it's it's as if they're saying that this whole vanity and being obsessed with materialism and being obsessed with um, the way you look and how you feel and your body and your weight is something new Pe women and men are all around the world have been obsessed with how they look from from the age of probably hollywood it's just been one of those kind of fixtures of life it's, it can be a bit unfortunate some people can feel as if it's not a good thing but i think as society if you're worried about young girls go and speak to those young girls if you're worried about young girls go and speak to their young girls parents because i think sometimes again there is an over-reliance and over-dependency right on 
making sure celebrities know what to say or how what how much power they have with young kids i think the responsibility lies squarely within the parents within the guardians within the support system around them not with the people they see on tv if your kid is getting influenced or is thinks that they should have plastic surgery because of kendall or kylie then that's your problem as a parent or as a guardian you you're the one that fucked up right that's your issue it's not their issue they should be allowed to get as much work as they want to get done on their bodies they should be allowed to promote as many flat tummy tea lollipops as they want right but what they should be able to do is that they should be able to have a support them around them where if they were to ask oh auntie jamila do you think this flat tummy tea thing is a good idea you should be able to then tell them maybe um um what do you call it in terms of a long-term goal of maintaining weight loss or to be healthy in life maybe sucking on a lollipop that's going to suppress your appetite so you only eat a salad a day isn't a good idea that should be your place as a guardian or as a member of the family to kind of step in but it shouldn't be a case of like de-platforming the kardashians because that, that's again so i'm saying like what do you want do you want to take away their show do you want to delete them from social media i don't believe that either i think everyone should be allowed the platform no matter what garbage you're spewing out there you should be allowed to put you should be allowed to put your shit out within a public square and us as citizens and civilians should be able to look at it the ones that want to join you should be able to jump on your soapbox when i don't want to join you should be able to throw tomatoes at you that's how it should work but you shouldn't be we shouldn't get to the point where we're deep platforming people and saying that Kardashians can't have something to say because there's always going to be girls out there who think looking good or feeling good about your body is the main goal in life right they everything they do is centered around making sure they feel and look good there's so many youtube videos i've seen on there of like um uh female vloggers who do the whole like uh sunday self-care day right where they kind of go through their kind of whole day of how they kind of put themselves together um what they do in terms of meditation practices in terms of like green juice and all that sort of stuff walks reading blah 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 there is a kind of movement towards that that kind of like self-care then there is also an, an, a kind of offshoot of that where they're obsessed with making sure that they're in shape or getting surgery or whatever it may be i just think they should be allowed to do it i, I just don't know why you care like if you're Jamila Jamil and you're like you've obviously an educated person, you know what you're talking about. Why would you care about what these girls are doing? In that the girls that are obsessed with Kim Kardashian or, or the Kardashian clan are always going to be obsessed with that. Someone else will replace when whenever they whenever they run ends, someone else will, re will replace them and it'll just continue again. But there's also going to be a group of girls out there who are going to be open to hearing other bits of information. And I don't think you should be putting yourself in a position where you're tearing down one woman in order to kind of raise up yourself or to raise up what you think is ideal. I think what you should be doing is maybe openly criticizing them, maybe saying what they're doing isn't healthy, um, but not tearing them down, saying that they have body or facial dysmorphia. You don't know them. That's not a nice thing to say. What, what makes you think they have body? Because someone cares about what they look. It's a weird thing, isn't it? I mean, again, maybe it's, a, maybe it's kind of a British thing. I don't know if it's a British thing or US thing, but there is a... There is a thing, I know, especially with, even sometimes with boys, there is a thing where if you hang around a group of boys and you go out and you're really dressed up, like you went really crazy, you do get sometimes taken the piss out by your friends, like you're trying too hard, right? There's a weird, I don't know if it's a British thing, where like people don't like when you try hard, when you like give a shit about what you look like. Maybe it's the fact that, you know, it's a little bit um, self-indulgent, um, it, it looks like you're selfish, it looks like you're self-centered because, you know, you care about the self, but... If you care about yourself and you care about your house, you care about your room, you want to keep yourself tidy, that doesn't mean you don't care about people. It just means you're aware that sometimes the way you dress and the way that your space is arranged around you can sometimes reflect your inner internal monologue, right? Sometimes when you're, there's a lot of, it's like the whole Jordan Peterson clean up your bedroom thing. When, you, when you're sometimes in chaos, you can sometimes reflect that in the way you're dressed, right? Your beard's disheveled, you've got some shit going for three days in a row. It's not a bad idea to take care of yourself or to make sure you feel good in order to somehow trick yourself to make sure you feel good. It, it, I don't know. All these little things are okay to do. And even if it's not even that deep, even if it's just a, a, an idea of just like, I just want to look good. I don't care what you think. That should be allowed as well. I don't know. Again, I, I, I just don't understand how this is constructive in any sort of way. I don't think it's criticism by, you know, saying that they need to like, how much money do they need? Like, who are you to say that? It's none of your business. Oh, body or facial dysmorphia. It's a bit shocking. And again, that this Jamila Jamil, for the most part, in my eyes, again, because I don't watch TV, but she's made her name in my eyes because she's tearing down the Kardashians. And I'm again, I'm not a fan. This is the weird thing. I'm not even a fan of theirs, right? But I just don't understand. I just, and I've never watched a show of theirs in my life. Every time the brunette plays in the background and I, and I hear their drony, mundane voice talking about the most um, asinine thing in the world, I just want to like shoot myself in the face, right? Because it's just, I don't get how that's popular. But it is. 
And, I, and I'm not going to be the person that's going to, like, stop her fun and be like, oh, turn that shit off. I'm just going to go into the next room. Or I'm going to play my thing on my headphones. That's what everyone should do. Like, if you don't like something, just go about your life and like what you like. But there's no point telling people not to like what they like. I don't, I've don't. i never understood that way of thinking. Like, with X Factor or Big Brother, all these things that people love to watch, Love Island, which I don't watch, right, I don't care for. I don't, I'm not going to stop you from watching by saying, do not watch this show. This show is crazy. One show you shouldn't watch on fucking Love. Like, what? It's fucking nuts. Like, I, I don't get it. I just don't get it. It's really, really strange um, way of going about things. Um, again, I don't understand it. I think she's obviously got a lot of great things to say. I think... They might, her intentions might be pure in some respects, you know, maybe the fact that she's attractive and she's been given a lot of opportunities based on her looks has sometimes, and maybe made her a bit embittered or a little bit cynical because she feels as if like people should be given a platform to speak because she's obviously a very intelligent and well-spoken person. But also like the only reason why I know you is because you're talking about the Kardashians. That's a bit, you know what I mean? That's where it gets a bit, a bit ropey for me in, in my regard. Like, and and again, who am I to say anything? I don't know what's going on there, but I just think some girls should be allowed. Girls should be allowed to enjoy um, watching the Kardashians talk dronely about their family or obsess about a new handbag or new shoe if they want to. Right? The show's what fifteen seasons in or something like that. Right? The Kardashians. I don't even want to check. You, let's say it's more than ten seasons in. Like, it's not gonna stop, guys. Like, relax. Just take your foot off the like. It's ribbing the kardashians kind of feels like talking about trump it's so tr it's so like it's low-hanging fruit it's like okay we get it like everyone thinks he's an idiot all right bad president all right not presidential enough cool like move on like move on move on but i think there's a there is a group of people maybe jamila jamil involved may, included who want to who want to be the person to always speak about these kind of things so when they're down so when the take down happens when they get quote unquote deplatformed or cancelled in some respects they can sometimes they can maybe take front and center right and then be the person to replace them that sometimes i think that's so that's why it comes to virtue signaling comes of it right because everyone everyone's kind of sniping at trump and they're not st and they kind of not stopping because you know it's easy click so if you talk about a condition like for instance i'm speaking about what jimmy jimmy was talking about now it's got three point uh, something then 3.10 plus views right million views so there is this idea that you know sometimes it can be a good Trojan horse, right? If you're an educated, cultured person to kind of speak about real big pop culture icons and then to somehow segue or somehow, you know, bring in your kind of ideology or message in within that, right? It's a good Trojan horse method to do, but I think, I don't think it's necessary. I think there, there, there is, there needs to be a return to minding your own business and also be, there needs to be a return to if you don't like something, just ignore it. Like, this is the free market. We live in, an, in a society where if you make a t-shirt and no one likes it, no one will buy it. If you make a restaurant and no one likes it, no one will come in. Like, this is the free society we live in. You don't need to um, stand outside with placards and protest and say, shut this restaurant down and shit. Their wings are not good. They make rubbish burgers. Eventually, no one will go. I mean, just stop going. I don't, I don't, I don't get this whole movement behind, I don't like something, so I'm going to tell everyone not to like it as well. It's very, very bizarre. But anyway. I guess she has her own motives to go about these kind of things, but me no fan. Anyway, next on the docket, um, Kanye West. So, um, Kanye has been a Kanye has been on a bit of a rebrand um, these last couple of weeks. Um, he's been he's visited he's visiting Chicago. He's been in Chicago for a while now. I think maybe like two weeks or whatever. And it looks like um, we first kind of learned of it because the rumors were that he was gonna work on work on Chance the Rapper's album, right? And then, you know, Chance the Rapper, you know, the, the, the independent uh, artist. <laughs> that was funny, that whole independent skirmish, isn't it? Um, but yeah, the rumor was he was um, going to be working on Chance the Rapper's album. So he went to Chicago to kind of get locked in with that. And then now he's been a bit of a, on the press uh, rebrand, talking to loads of kind of like in uh, local Chicago radio stations that, are, again, because I'm not from Chicago, but it seems like watching the interviews, a lot of the people are really happy to see him. He seems really generally happy to be there. Loads of radio stations look, look like the kind of places where they played an instrumental role in these kind of a session to kind of being the, you know, the star that he is now. But a lot of what he's saying, and again, maybe it's because of the whole, maybe it's because... Personally, for me, maybe it's because I've been so, you know, I've been so engrossed with the whole intellectual dark web group of people. I've been so engrossed with reading um, different articles or following different sorts of people on the right and the left on Twitter. You know, I've, I follow a lot of lots of kind of like um, um, nationalistic sort of kind of Twitter accounts. Right. That can be a, like, that can get a bit dicey. It can get a bit a bit um, 
a bit right wing but i try and follow as many different voices as i can right on the whole kind of like um social media platforms right? i try to diversify my information source just so i can understand get like a kind of rounded view on what's kind of going on and the books that i'm reading are kind of give me a bit more of a historical context that's maybe a little bit sometimes it's a, it's a gender driven sometimes it can be a little bit it can be quite straightforward and just like reporting on the facts so because of that i think my, now I list when I listen to someone like Kanye West speak because I think a few years ago when I wasn't really that I wasn't I wasn't that well read or I wasn't paying attention to what was going on when someone like Kanye West was speaking to me I maybe I maybe held I maybe what he maybe said held a lot more weight than it does now right and now I listen to his interviews and I, I listen to him I just I just don't see what he's talking about I just see someone rambling um, incoherently about topics that they don't really know that much about and then saying things such as like and then what to kind of cap it off what kind of really threw me off or kind of really kind of made me feel away was during one interview on a chicago radio station he said something along the lines of um i don't read i'm not a reader i, I go with my feeling i go with my emotion i go with my gut I, I i pray on it i let the lord speak to me and i was like what like that's the complete opposite that's a complete opposite of being educated on what you're talking about on knowing what you're talking about and it made me kind of question why exactly are people getting their noses out of joint or getting annoyed or getting pissed off about what Kanye has to say when he's telling you point blankly that he doesn't read he doesn't want to be well read he doesn't want to educate himself on his topics because he, he he doesn't want to fear losing the instinct that kind of like gut feeling he has on things that, that kind of and again that's led him well on his journey artistically right i'm sure that gut feeling that kind of like going with the kind of first thing that comes to your you know, um to your head has um, led him to become this global icon. But when it comes to talking about societal issues and it comes to being a cultural commentator, that can also get you in trouble, right? Because you're not thinking about what you're talking about. You haven't got any context. You haven't got any sort of philosophical grounding to kind of like hold what you're saying with any sort of weight. It's all kind of like superfluous shit just thrown out in the air. And again, I don't know whether it's an age thing. I don't know if because I've got different sort of um, inputs coming in at the moment, but I just don't know. These couple of interviews I've been listening to him, I'm trying to really get the point of it, but he just doesn't know what he's speaking about. He, he says one point, he kind of back to says something else, then he goes another tangent, then he's just all over the place, all rambly. And I don't know. Um, I guess the only bit about it that kind of was a bit sad and kind of you did feel a bit bad for him was when he started crying about Don C, right? He, there's a bit where he's talking upset. And because they start to go over the whole TMZ interview, um, 400 years, sounds like a choice comment. And he basically was saying that he feels like a lot of the stuff wouldn't have happened if he had his friends around him. But he also understands that he has put into a position where he hasn't had his friends around him. He's kind of isolated himself by just kind of going into the bunker and hanging out only with the Kardashians. Um, and again, I don't know, man. I have, I have no idea. I think I'm at the stage in life where I'm able to enjoy people's art and kind of divorce their personality and i've done it for a long i've done it f since the days i loved morrissey as soon as i read my first more interview i had to make my decision because you know morrissey is morrissey is very divisive in the things that he says right you only have to read one interview from him to know that he's kind of like he you know he he tests of he, he's a real test of a fan's loyalty and i had to realize i had to i had to kind of like come to grips really quickly okay am i gonna delete this music that kind of framed or that kind of was a soundtrack to a lot was the soundtrack to my life growing up right or am i gonna accept him for being who he is for being fucking nuts and then just put that to one side and just enjoy the music and i just did i just enjoyed the music so i'll play the smiths to this day i'll play the smiths right i'll play anything to do with morrissey i'm i'm, I'm a big fan of but i can separate the stuff that he says about politics so i can separate the stuff about he says about society i can just separate it. i don't need to kind of l l listen to it he's uh, he's kind of whack -mo, anti animal cruelty comments i can separate that too same with Kanye West. i feel i'm just in that place where i can enjoy the yeezys i can enjoy the stage design i can enjoy the album covers i can enjoy some of the productions but i just don't i just don't care for the kind of societal thing because i just i just don't think i sh i just don't think any i just don't think you should listen to anyone who hasn't really meditated or sat down with their thoughts or or giving their thoughts and or kind of gone through the rigmarole of having their thoughts be debated within an open platform or kind of read up on topics you shouldn't be giving them your attention you shouldn't be giving their opinion in any way because they haven't done the bare minimum in order to kind of give their opinion more of a grounding they just gone out and just said a whole bunch of stuff right just to say like oh i feel like this and that isn't enough like i think if you're a kanye and again, I'm not that kind of person to go, oh, yeah, know, know your power. But if you're a Kanye and you know how much people stand over you, you know how 
how many sheep you have that just follow what you say or follow what you wear or just copy you. Like, I remember working in 1948 once and just, I don't know what he wore one time, but I remember, I think maybe it was a leather jacket in Balmain era. Do you remember that era when Kanye West was wearing leather jackets in Balmain arenas, arena highs? And there was a guy, three or four guys that came into 1948 and it's worked there back in the day, right? And just they just looked exactly head to toe like Kanye. And I couldn't understand how anyone could, how a grown man could want to wear you know, we'll look at somebody, right? I've always said to my friends, like, if ever I see Rocky, Travis, or someone wearing something I'm wearing, I will stop wearing it, right? I'm just not going to wear it because I don't want anyone to say, oh, you're looking at Tyler. Like, go fuck yourself, right? Like, I've got my own style. I have my own inspiration. I don't need to, like, look at another man to kind of get my idea on how to dress. Like, it's not going to happen. I've got too much of an ego to do that. But I remember notice, I remember realizing the power Kanye had because I saw three fairly um, normal-looking dudes come in dressing like their idol, Kanye West. So I think there has to be an acknowledgement on Kanye West's side to understand that you have some people in your in your fan base who would blindly follow you. I'm sure this is weird. This can sound weird, but I'm pretty sure there's some Kanye West fans out there who were going out with big bummed, light skinned black girls, right? When he was going at Amber Rose, who then switched with who then switched to going out with big bum, big titted white girls who kind of look like Kim Kardashian. There must be some guys out there who do that. It's sort of like that dude who hangs. Who's the Who's a dude that goes out with Chris Jenner? There's a guy that goes out with Chris Jenner who basically looks like Kanye. He's like a fatter version of Kanye. He has a bald head, the same sort of goatee. He just like Kanye West. And he goes out with Chris Jenner, right? Because it seems like the whole family has a thing for black dudes anyway in general, which is not a bad thing. You know, do your thing. But um, there's a black guy that goes out with Chris Jenner and he kind of has the same look as Kanye too. So I don't know. I worry, man. I worry. I just, I just worry for... I worry for him mentally. I worry for his fan mentally because I, I, he's gonna he's gonna take he's gonna take those guys, especially the guys that are blindly following. He's gonna take them down to some real deep places where you got to really question where you're going. But I think personally for me, I'm I've reached a point now where I'm able to kind of like, especially after listening to him rambling a few times in these Chicago based interviews, I'm able just to kind of like put him to one side, put her, what he says to one side, and put Kanye the artist to one side too. Um, because, you know, you even mentioned in this interview that, you know, he wants to, he's, he's still thinking about running for president and he feels as if, like, you know, you can't run for president if you don't know how to run a business. It's like, what? 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 It's like, what are you talking, like, like it, again, it's like, what are you talking about? Like, can you tell us why? Because he feels as if running a, running a business is like, you know, running a company. He feels as if, like, what Trump says sometimes, the reason why it comes off really curt or really harsh is because that's how businessmen speak. It's like, what? All businessmen speak like that? Like, again, I, I I don't know. I don't know. I, I will, You wonder what kind of conversations... Again, I think it's really difficult to be Kanye West and to have, like, to get a, to get constructive criticism or to get, like, some real kickback from what you're talking about because, unfortunately, when you employ people or when you pay them just to be around you or to consult or to be an ear for you to kind of, like, chew on, it can be hard... Because even if you're the most opinionated person, you don't want to shit where you eat, right? You don't want to, you, you don't, you know where your bread is buttered, right? You don't want to, you don't want to really go back and forth with Kanye and say, hey, you're talking out your ass, man. What are you talking about? You're talking shit. You're not going to do that, right? Even if you're the most well, um, you've got the best um, interest in your, you know, like, you're not going to do that. You, I, I understand. You're not going to do that. You're going to just, and it might sound, it might look like you're hanging, you might be a hanging around or a weed carrier, but it's within reason that you're not going to push back and argue with Kanye. It makes sense, right? He's paying for you to be there. He's flying you out to fashion weeks and shit. Like, it makes sense just to shut up and kind of go with the ride, right? Or go with the journey. But it, for the sake of Kanye, it can sometimes be a little bit, you know, you, he has a disadvantage because he doesn't surround himself. With, it doesn't look like he's got people that surround himself who can kind of call him out on his bullshit and say, like, what the fuck are you talking about? And just not 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 so he can change his mind. I'm not saying that, but so he can kind of like run his idea through the through the mill, right? Kind of like you know smooth them out, sharpen them up a little bit, because it's it's a little bit one way ish. It's kind of like this podcast sometimes. Imagine if I was spewing out ideas that you didn't agree with. I don't really have anyone to bounce them off with, right? That's kind of Joe Rogan's argument against people like Alex Jones. The reason why he says crazy shit is because he's in the studio ram ranting for two hours and a half, right? With no one to kind of like go back and forth with, no one to kind of like, hey, hey, slow down. What was that you said there? Like, what does that mean? Do you know what I mean? Like, he just kind of you can kind of like just say shit. Um, and and it seems as if every time he kind of is kind of is in a room with people, they're just happy to be in a room with him, right? Um. So that kind of that star power is just so that stuff that his light is so bright that 
they're unable even to kind of like say anything back. They just want to sit there and bask in it, which is understandable, but he's the one that's suffering really for the most part because his ideas aren't really getting run through the mill. They're just kind of like floating up there. But again, I don't know. I'm I, I, Again, like I said, I've reached a point where I'm able to separate the artist um, or their opinions from the artists, from what they produce, the artwork they're kind of putting out there, which is a good thing to get to. I think that's maybe the key to maturity. Anyway, um, topic number three on the topic, um, Supreme Encouraging Snitching. <laughs> this story popped up um, the other day I saw on, on Hypebeast. I'm pretty sure it's been on social media, but I've, I'm not got an Instagram, so I haven't seen. But supposedly someone tried to tear down the, or, or break or take off the, the Supreme Box logo on their store on, uh, in Soho. I think this happened uh, uh, before in New York or something, right? Did it happen before or did it happen already in London? Or was that when a guy tried to smash the window? What happened? Anyway, so something's happened. Someone tried to vandalize the store already before. So they've already had a few run-ins with like random um, goings on. But it's a bit weird how they're kind of going about this one, right? So suppose the story goes that they're, they're basically encouraging people to report who the person is in, in exchange for a reward. And the reward is like a box logo crew neck, I think, in any color you want, right? So the story goes as follows on Hypebeast. Um, Supreme London offers rewards to anyone who can ID a man who defaced their storefront. Earlier this morning, a man was caught on a security cam attempting to rip off the Supreme London storefront sign. As reported by Supreme Leaks News on Instagram, the London Outpost manager, Dan Yeager, is offering up a free box logo crew neck of your choice to anyone who can identify the vandal. But watch the video below. And if you know this man, turn him in. DM Yeager on Instagram. It's like... What the fuck is going on here? So this dude, obviously, from a night out, you know, he's drunk. He's probably a bit fucked up. He's getting a bit, you know, he's getting a bit giddy. He's got a good outfit on, to be honest, though. Um, And he's trying to put, take off the fucking sign on the on the shop. And it's obviously not coming down, and it? It's not coming, it's not coming down as he hopes to. But that's not right, is it? Should they be encouraging snitching? I know this guy's a dork and he shouldn't be doing this. And it's, you know, it's not a good thing, but. Come on, dudes. You're, they're, they're encouraging kids to snitch on a guy. Like, I don't know. Just pass his image around to the police and stuff. But I don't know. Um, especially, I think the idea that they, they're asking people to snitch in terms so they can get a reward. That's the bit that I'm a little bit iffy about. I think they've totally just put it out there and say, I did this, man. Let's publicly shame him and shit. That's more than cool. And then pass his details on the police, right? But telling kids to snitch so they, for a crew neck. But, you know, these, these kids that love Supreme are definitely going to do it. But, you know, it's, it's unlikely that anyone in that queue would know who this guy is because he looks like, you know, a, a general's kind of city boy. But how fucked up do you have to be to kind of jump up and grab a sign and try and tear it down, by the way? Huh? Ah, what are you doing, man? Go home. I don't know. Get an escort or something, man. What the fuck are you doing? And it's a, it's a weird shape as well. I don't know what the what the fitting looks like on the side. Probably it's probably hard to bend off. Or what they might have done. You know what? You know how um the Rolls Royce signs are like anti tamper proof, right? You can can't bend them off anymore. Maybe they've got the same thing with the Supreme sign. They've kind of done a, a thing where they've kind of bolted it at the back, or they've got like a little ball bearing on the back, so it doesn't actually bend off. It kind of just spins around. You can't actually break it off. That might be a good idea. Um, so you can imagine, so imagine they had like a sign with like a little pole coming out and then inside it's sort of like, um, it's sort of like a ball bearing that you can kind of like rotate the sign around 360, you kind of move it around up and down around 360. So you can't actually break it off, which is really a good, which is great anti-tamper proof, um, measure to put on it. But again, you have to be, how fucked do you have to be to jump up and try and grab a sign off the street when just coming from a night out? People are weird. Again, it's that, it's that Dutch courage, that's that man thing, right? When you're out with your mates and you're getting a bit giddy, you think you're hard and shit. Like, I don't, I, I don't know any friends that will do that. I think that's super losery. I think it happened before in some cafe in New York, right? Some girl was sitting outside, which is even worse, I think. What cafe was it? Some, some cafe where they had like a piñata style horse, like a green horse on the outside. And there's a bench outside opposite the shop and a girl sitting down there with a guy and I think it's, it's, it's even worse because that's premeditated. This, is, this can be a bit excusable because, you know, he's, he's obviously fucked up. It's obviously late at night and, you know, he's feeling a little bit um, brave and shit. But this girl in the cafe, in, I think it's in New York, sits outside the cafe, opposite chair. She's sitting there talking to, the, talking to her male friend and then she suddenly decides to get up and take the fucking horse from outside the store. And the horse is obviously like a bit of a, a thing that they stick out. It's not like stuck, it's not like left outside there like a, like a like some rubbish. It's obviously outside as a kind of like, you know, as a bit of um, furnishing for the outside of the store and just takes it. Like, but who does that, right? What kind of person 
what kind of selfish person just takes something that isn't theirs? I never understood that kind of point of view, that kind of like way of thinking, especially grown adults. Like, grow up a little bit. But yeah, so people encouraging snitching. I'm not really for it. I think put the it put the guy's image out, inform the police. But I'm not for this whole like get a free box logo if you snitch on a person. Like that's super weird. Um. Anyway, that aside, um, Hedy Slimane has changed the Celine logo. Dun dun dun. Big news. Big big news. Sim, um, Heidi Slimane from you know of uh, Dior Homme fame. Um, of recently of Saint Laurent fame. You know, probably one of the most influential designers that of our modern, probably of menswear of the menswear era, right? From the skinny jeans to the Saint Laurent white boot. I think if you're if if you're a male design menswear designer and you're able to design. Um, you, you're able to inter- reintroduce um, skinny jeans into the male. You're, into, able, you're able to make skinny jeans a worldwide phenomenon. You're able to introduce the doc, the Saint Laurent white boot, right, and make that one of the I don't know one of the best selling shoes of modern times, right? Your place is cemented as uh, menswear great. No one can test you, right? And now this guy is now has the omnibus job of taking over from Phoebe Filer at Celine. And he's going to introduce a menswear line because they never had one before. Um, and obviously, they're going to have to ramp up, I think, the e-commerce. So they're going to have an online shop, which is something that Phoebe Fowler wasn't really that keen on. Everything was kind of done uh, via their stores. But then towards the end of her tenure, I remember Phoebe Fowler did a thing where they introduced a thing where you could stock check on the online store. Um, you could kind of They kind of had all the looks from the runway and then you could kind of stock check certain items Um from each look and find them in different stores kind of what similar to what gucci did when they first launched their e-commerce i think maybe you can still do that now you can sort of look you can maybe shop the whole looks but burberry do the opposite right burberry do burberry take it the whole way you can shop the entire looks right on the kind of runway i remember when um kaida levine won that like her lgbt kind of like flag um first sh- overcoat long thing you that whole entire look was available online uh, minutes later after the, the show ended but as per usual whenever these it's kind of a trend now. Whenever a new creative director, artistic director takes over a house, a fashion brand, they always kind of redo the the kind of you know the, the general artwork of the brand, the store in the store design, um, stationery, um, the general language. Because you know it's an opportunity for you to stamp your mark to kind of leave your legacy. You know, because you know Phoebe Fowler had her time to kind of you know to kind of leave her mark and what she thought Celine was to her, and then now uh, Heidi Cement takes over, and you have a chance now to kind of stamp your mark. So you don't just take over what's there left, because even Virgil's done the same thing with Louis Vuitton. I saw a picture of um, the office that um, um, Kim Jones had where they had the kind of like um, Supreme and Louis Vuitton uh, flooring and carpet and all that sort of stuff. I think they've kind of t- he's tore it all up again. They're going to redo it. So you have to kind of you have to do that with a brand. You have to come in and kind of stamp your own mark and leave your own legacy um, for years and years to come so you can be remembered and you know, have something to show in your CV, wh- wherever it may be. So if, um, Saint, um, Hedy Simmons is doing the same thing. He kind of divided opinion when he did that, when he went to YSL, you know, he changed it to Saint Laurent uh, or he, ver- he reverted back to Saint Laurent and had, had you, know, the kind of, you know, that kind of like block let text. And he's done the same thing with Celine by dropping the accent. So this is the big reveal that everyone was kind of getting upset about. That's that's the logo that he's kind of changed it for, right? So it used to be the old logo with a little accent on top of it, but now he's kind of replaced it with this little logo and this little video here, which I'll play for you guys to listen to. This is the introducing the new Celine. So we're gonna. So that's gonna happen very soon. And then what else have we got to show you from this? Oh, did, did you guys see the um, the store interior looks absolutely sick. Someone posted a video of it the other day. Someone posted some pictures of it the other day. Let me quickly try and get it up. Uh, Celine, I think Miami store, right? Miami store. I think it's Miami. 
they've kind of redone the Miami store or maybe it's a new store that's newly opened. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, oh, this is old. It's from 2000. It's from 2000 and... Uh, okay, Miami store, the brand new, the, the, the Mang. Located in the... the, the okay, m m maybe it's not a... Uh, um, maybe it's not a... Uh, Maybe it's not highly the main design, but I saw this as well. This is the new store in, in Miami that's been redone. It looks amazing, isn't it? Blue marble everywhere. Looks absolutely beautiful, but I'm pretty sure it's not because it's got a lot of the old, old last pieces from the old Celine collection that um, Phoebe Filer put together. So let me just see what it looks like later. Actually, let's see what the Celine, Celine website looks like actually now. I didn't type that in right there, but let's see what it looks like. Um, Celine, your identity part one. So I'd obviously redone the text. What's happening here? So the new collection should be launching soon, right? Hopefully we get to see that very, very soon. I think the end of September, they're doing in Paris Fashion Week. So that should be very interesting to take a look at. But yeah, this is the new Celine. Here we are. Um, I'm sure people are going to get their nose out bent about it. People wanted, you know, to hold on to the past and shit. But it's going to be interesting to see what it does with the collection overall. Um... What he does with the menswear, we will see the Celine plasters across logos and hoodies and shit. Because that's one thing I always wanted to see, right? Just t -sh basic t-shirts with Celine on the front. And just to see what kind of footwear he brings in, what kind of bags he does. Um, it's very, very interesting time in general for all fashion fans out there. And I think I think it's September 28th. I think so. That's when the new collection launches. I've, I'm sure it's 20th, 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 20th we're going to be able to see what Heidi Semain has um, in store for Celine. Let's double check on on now fashion. This is a place where I come and check and see all my show schedule stuff. So it should be interesting to see. Let's find Celine on here. Yep, Celine. Oh, see, I did guess it right. Celine is going to debut at Paris Fashion Week at September twenty eighth, seven thirty p.m. So if you're a fan of menswear or fashion in general or anything that Heidi does, I highly recommend you mark that off in your calendars. Anyway, what's next on the docket for you guys to check out here? Um. Let's see what else we've got on our list before we head out. We have here... Um, oh, Supreme and Mike Kelly. This is really cool. This just came out the other day, actually. I was a, I'm was i a big fan of this. I think some people that I've spoken to have said this is the best thing that Supreme have put out since um, in, a, in a long while. It's weird because a lot of people haven't really, haven't really been a fan of the Four Winter stuff, right? Because I think the... I don't know why. Like I'm always a I'm always a big fan of Supreme Fall Winter. I don't think there's ever been an all winter or fall winter that I haven't been a fan of. Like they, they the strongest collection that they do is the winter for the most part. I guess men's fashion for the most part always works best in winter in terms of overcoats, in terms of jackets, in terms of blazers, uh, sweaters, sweat bottoms, jeans. That's kind of the staple of man's wardrobe, right? Men don't usually look that great in summer, innit, for the most part. Like maybe Maybe this year was different because, you know, shorts became a new big trend and a lot of brands were focusing on making some cool shorts. You know, Pharrell was out there wearing Muay Thai shorts. Um, cactus, flowers, cactus, flower, ca cactus plant flower market, whatever that brand is called, was making some cool shorts. Everyone kind of had their great little shorts that they were putting out there, right? Um, it was kind of big on the whole street style scene overall. But in general, men kind of really, really um, set themselves apart, especially stylish men when it comes to the winter. And I'm always, I always think Supreme really hit at the park. But for the most part, a lot of people have been saying they've really enjoyed this uh, Mark Kelly, uh, Mike Kelly, sorry, um, collaboration with Supreme that's due to come out. I think this Thursday. Um, it's just I saw it kind of talked about the other day. It's actually, it just launched the other day actually in my email. So I'll kind of read this quickly, and you guys can quickly scan through some of these images. Uh, Mike Kelly and Supreme. I read it from the website. It's on Supreme New York, of course. You know the site. Um, American artist Mike Kelly was born in Wayne. Massachusetts in 1954. Active in Detroit's upstart punk scene, Kelly moved to Los Angeles in the mid 1970s. On the West Coast, he developed an interdisciplinary practice spanning drawing, painting, performance, video installation, assemblage, and sound, incorporating found objects and folk traditions. Kelly integrated American pop culture and the, and the rituals of youth. He died in 2012 at the age of 57 and is considered the most influential artist of his generation. This Four Supreme has worked with Mike Kelly Foundation for the Fat Arts on a collection featuring images from Kelly's iconic artworks, More Love Hours Than Can Be Ever Be Repaid and The Wages of Sin Art Youth and the Reconstructed History Series. The collection consists of work of a work jacket, Ryan shirt and other bits and bobs. It will be available in New York, in store New York, Brooklyn, LA and Paris and online September 6th and available in Japan on the 8th. It's fucking great, I think. This jacket that this kid's wearing here on the preview is probably the best bit on in there. 
I think that might be the thing that's going to fly out in terms of general. Like, this jacket is fucking insane. I love this so good. Like, and the shirts as well. Everyone that's been wearing funky shirts this season, you know, Prada, Louis Vuitton have been doing a lot of, like, funky uh, short sleeve kind of, like, all, all over print uh, shirts, which is coming back into vogue again. And the whole all over print thing is really, really coming back into fashion. Everyone's kind of doing this. Like, this is an amazing World Trade Center with the drawn as a penis. Um, some really really cool bits and bobs like but this jacket this this work jacket is amazing the RU work jacket that is really nice man it kind of reminds me a little bit of the um, you know the kind of the, the the western jacket the kind of american with the, the the kind of cowboy jacket the guy riding a horse that has kind of the same sort of all over print um yep yeah, so that's that jacket is really cool the shirt's amazing i think a lot of people are going to want to cop the shirt um, again, for everyone that's been wearing that Prada shirt, that Jeff Goob- Jeff Goldblum, Jeff Goldblum and Push T and all those guys have been wearing lately, that's going to be something that you're going to be probably a fan of. Um, again, Supreme always makes good work shirts with a nice print on the back. That character looks cool. Um, that hoodie is really nice too, really fun. So yeah, nice collection overall, some great pieces. And it's due to come, I think, this Thursday. So if anyone is on the lookout, this is a really nice long sleeve as well, actually. As I'm looking out to buy these bits and pieces, I, I recommend hitting up your nearest connect because I'm sure this is all going to fly out really, really quickly. There's no chance it's going to hang around. And the decks look great too, actually. The decks look amazing. So, yeah, this is due to come out very, 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 very soon. Anyway, um, I think that might be a good place to end it because we're just hit one hour, ten minutes. I don't want to keep rambling on and on about Supreme and Mike Kelly and all that sort of stupid ingronious things and i'll maybe come back on the other side but yeah that's been it for the action zinger show number episode number 101 it's been a fun occasion i like to kind of hit these out the part at 101 or at one hour 10 minutes plus i think maybe one day i'll try and do a two hour podcast but i don't want to do them too long you know what i mean it's already long enough as it is me rambling and rambling but yeah this has been number episode number 101 the zinger show thanks so much for tuning in and for hanging around it's always a pleasure to speak to you guys and connect and have a bit of you know fun times with the listeners um i will see you guys again tomorrow when i'm maybe feeling a little bit better and stuff but for you guys that are have a very jam-packed important week i hope you do all the things that you're meant to do and keep yourself and your family and friends nice and safe um as always um if you need any information on the stuff that i'm doing or the things that i am about then please click the link below at you can find out all my listings dj gigs blogs social media links all that malarkey down below in the link below as always subscribe like share uh, let your friends know what i'm doing spread the word organic growth that's what we're looking for right no cutting corners we're organically growing until we get to that 1000 mark a 1000 sub mark and then we'll be able to monetize this shit so that i can quit my job and just concentrate on youtube come on help the kid out Anyway, this is Show, episode number 101. Thanks so much for tuning in. Um, if you want to visit my sponsor, Audible, and, and claim a 30-day free um, trial as well as one free book credit, click below, help me out. If you want to support me on Patreon and buy me a beer, also do that, help me out. Uh, but until then, I'll see you guys again tomorrow for another episode of the Excellent Zinger Show. Thanks so much for tuning in. Peace out.